All right, good evening. Thank you for joining us for the February 6th Board of Education meeting. If you could all please join me for a pledge to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. We will start this evening with the report of the superintendent, Dr. Byrne. Thank you very much. Good evening, and thank you all for joining us for our February 6th Board of Education meeting. Given the February break is taking place the week after the week of February 19th, we have two back-to-back -back Board of Education meetings scheduled this month. Tonight and again next Tuesday, February 13th. Next Tuesday is also our second Open Topics Forum session of the school year, so we hope some community members will come out with questions and comments for our Board of Education trustees. Tonight kicks off the official budget season here in the district. This evening we will have the presentation of my proposed budget for the 24-25 school year. For the next two Board of Education meetings, we'll be hearing presentations about specific budget areas of interest to the public. Next week, we will learn about the curriculum budget, the special education and PPS segments of the budget. And on March 5th, we will learn about technology, athletics, and facilities. At 5.30 p.m. on Tuesday, March 19th, we will hold our annual community budget cafe here in the MPR. In the past, we have held this event on a Saturday morning, but we're going to try switching it to a weeknight in the hopes of gathering even more folks from the community for that session. We will send out detailed information closer to March 19th, so please mark your calendars. And now some very good sports news to share. The Rye Middle School Girls Squash Club Team is the national champion this wow. year. Okay. RMS sent three teams to the tournament in Philadelphia last weekend, and the girls won the national championship for Division II. We will be recognizing the team with Rye Recognition of Excellence Awards and an upcoming board meeting, so we look forward to congratulating them in person for this tremendous success. And that concludes my report for this evening. All right, thank you. This has been a great year for sports in Rye. Wonderful. All right, we will now move on to presentation and discussion number one, the superintendent's 2425 proposed budget presentation. Dr. Oh, Byrne. Okay, as usual, I'm going to move to the podium for this presentation each year. Do I have to go by the shot clock? Yes, definitely. <laughs> okay. So um, Gabby Perucho and I will be doing a joint presentation this evening of the proposed budget. And um, there are lots of different aspects to it. There are a lot of slides and a lot of information and we'll be um, taking certainly any questions from the board as we go throughout. So as we always begin with all of our presentations and everything we do here in the district, we always begin with the ride commitment. Over the last few board meetings, you and the community have seen what does this actually mean and how is it actualized in our classrooms. We've had a chance to hear from our administrators from our buildings, hear from teachers, hear from students of what does that look like and how are we living the ride commitment each day in our schools. So tonight we will present a budget for the 24-25 school year that will allow us, the administrators, the staff, to uphold, to continue to uphold the right commitment and provide our students, families, and communities with the world-class education that they deserve and that has been assured to them. So when we think about building a school budget, it's a process that begins in earnest the day after the budget vote. So last May, we were very happy that the budget passed, and the next day, we got started on the budget proposal for this year. It's a thoughtful process that begins from zero. We do not just say, all right, what do we need to add from where we are? How do we make things better, we literally go back to 
the essence of what it is to be a school district and we go back to what are the critical features in building a budget and that's what we call the pillars of the school budget we look at enrollment and that dictates staffing we look at our infrastructure and as you know we've had many conversations over the years regarding our infrastructure we have beautiful buildings and a beautiful campus across the city of rye we have historic buildings and we have facilities that can be quite a challenge in maintaining and upkeeping. We need to focus on the infrastructure of technology. We need to focus on the human infrastructure, the support staff that is behind the scenes that makes everything work in this school district. We, as a collective bargaining school district, we have five bargaining units and we have contractual obligations that have been negotiated over time. We have very successfully negotiated contracts that have helped us to be fiscally prudent, to be able to budget conservatively, and continue to improve our school district. And we always, always have to look at programming. What are the courses that we are offering our students? What is our curriculum? What are our supports for our students? And how do we ensure that our staff is always improving and refining their practice through effective professional development? And a number of years back, we developed a series of operating standards that we use to ground our decision making in the budget development process. From the very lofty standard of providing excellence in teaching and learning, to ensuring that our instruction is innovative, academic, and that the programming both in classrooms and outside of classrooms is relevant, interesting to kids, and is grounded in data and data analysis. That we are supporting the physical and mental health of all of our students that we are providing inclusive special education programming and a continuum of supports and services that meet the needs of our diverse population of students with disabilities, our neurodiverse learners within the district. That we are maintaining the Board of Education class size guidelines. That we are implementing research-based professional development we are not making random decisions about what's the most effective work to do with our teachers and how do we make them better. We look to the research, we partner with experts, and we provide outstanding professional development that helps us to continue to provide and improve upon excellence in teaching and learning. And we always have to provide a safe, secure, and healthy environment that is energy efficient. And we ensure that in every decision that we make, that we are efficiently and appropriately utilizing our resources and our personnel. And we evaluate that regularly. And as always, that we are creating a fiscally responsible budget that provides long-term stability to the community. And that's something that's a big conversation every year. Student enrollment is, as we've talked about every year, and we've had the conversations of which demographers should we use and which demog demographers should we not use anymore. And it's often a moving target that will change throughout the process that we go through over the next few months. And while if you look at our chart, we're anticipating based at what we know right now a reduction of a few sections across the elementary levels and but basically a flat when you when you cannot predict the number of kindergartners which is always a great challenge for us we're looking at essentially a flat enrollment uh, as we go into the school year right now you'll see that there are a number of fewer sections and we anticipate based on attrition that any of those positions would not be refilled. So we will continue to update you through the process on enrollment, 
because often in, in most years, certainly since I've been here, the number we start with at this point in time and where we are in September when school opens often does change. You may have an increased section somewhere or a decreased section somewhere based on what's happening with the actual enrollment. And I will say that the notification just went out today. Our enrollment uh, begins on February 26th for kindergarten and new families. And that will certainly impact this chart and impact our thinking and planning as we move forward. We always look to um, the data that's available to us and look to our neighboring school districts and school districts, frankly, that we consider peers um, in the region to help us to sort of think about where we are in the landscape and looking at the per pupil cost and um, as provided from the Westchester Putnam School Boards Association. So this is the most current number that we have available to us which ranges with Byram Hills from just over $40,000 per student to East Chester at just over 29,000 per student. And we have Scarsdale there because we do, we are hoping to get that number between now and when we complete this budget process um, once uh, NIS, uh, West Putt updates those things. But you'll see we're, we're not at the top, we're not at the bottom. We have improved our standing with our per pupil cost um, over the number of years through uh, good, smart investments in our programs and our schools. There's a lot of information. There's a lot of information on this slide to celebrate. And there's a lot of information in terms of our strategic decisions that we have made and the program improvements that we have put in place in the school district, not just from the academic side of things, but from safety and security and mental and physical health. And I begin in 2017 on this list, and this is certainly something that's much easier to read as you look at um, the presentation itself on board docs or on the website. It's a really important chart because in this seven year period as a school district, and, and you have seen this through presentation after presentation and student exhibitions and visits to classrooms and programs. <clears throat> Things that we're able to celebrate today, having an engineering strand, six through 12, um, launching our new advanced math and science courses at the middle school for the coming school year. The, the way we have transformed from three elementary schools with, with an not aligned literacy program to a research-based literacy program that is now stretching K to eight our incredible work in the last few years around phonics instruction, the implementation of Hegarty, the handwriting work that we, we've put in place, the MTSS work, the data-based individualization, the extension of the extended school year from just being an academic program for our most needy students to be an academic and summer camp program with the city of Rye. The launching of the Academy, the AP Capstone, the International Baccalaureate as we are a candidate school to launch in 2025. The state seal of biliteracy, the, just the things to celebrate through the hard work and efforts of our administrators, our teachers and our students, through the incredible support of our community from our parent organizations and the Rye Fund for Education that have made it possible for things like um, the space redesign in so many spaces and our POs have helped that to bring state-of-the-art furnishings to our classrooms, to the animation and graphic design programs that we can now offer in the high school because of the Rive Fund for Education. But while we can celebrate all of those academic pieces, we cannot forget that safety and security is a huge piece and a piece of, of an area that we have grown so much in the past few years from adding a full-time district safety coordinator who's with us throughout the school year, the Raptor visitor management system. It wasn't too long ago that our front doors were not locked. Not only are our front doors locked now, but we have secure vestibule entrances and we have hardened our facilities and put in a sophisticated camera system we have secure card access at all of our schools. 
We have complete Salto lock systems that are state-of-the-art at Osborne, Milton, and Midland. We are on our way here at the high school and the middle school with select Salto locks in place. We have new PA lockdown systems at the elementary schools. We will be going there next here at the middle school and the high school. And we have forged a partnership and a relationship with our emergency services and the RIE PD that I think is unparalleled when you look across school districts in the area. The joint trainings as recent as Martin Luther King Day when our police department were doing tactical training at Osborne School. The fact that our police and our emergency services are at all of our drills and working side by side with us is part of our safety plans. We've done the things that no one ever wants to talk about like stop the bleed training and the lock zone training. We've addressed the mental and physical health of our students and we've taken steps to bring supports and services to our kids that a year or two ago I would have said I'm not sure we would ever be able to do this. Elementary counselors at each of the schools the therapeutic support services model here at the high school and the middle school, our counseling support from ESS, the mental health clinic that we launched uh, not so long ago with WJCS at 324 Midland. And these are all desperately needed services that are all providing incredible resources to our families and our students. We've added incredible programs like Unified Basketball, we now have a co-ed ski team that we did not have a few years ago. We have a girls hockey team that we did not have a few years ago. We have new basketball hoops in our gym. We have a full-time athletic trainer. We have AEDs that travel with every coach for every sport at every level, ensuring the safety of our students. We have nursing services for before and after school programs. And we've certified so many of our staff at this point with youth mental health first aid. It's just another way that we are working to provide the very best in mental and physical health for our kids. It's not easy to accomplish these things and it creates challenges when we're trying to build a budget. And this budget that I'm proposing tonight maintains all of our current programs and all of our current services. And it moves forward with the staff that we have without the addition of the, no additional teachers, no additional staff. So our approved budget for this current year is $103,899,000. My proposed budget is an increase of 6.41% for a proposed budget amount of $110,556,000. Yes, this budget proposal goes beyond the tax cap. You may recall some of you, not many of you were on the board at the time, but most of you were living in the community. In 2015, the school district went above the tax cap. And at the time, said to the community, this tax cap is a challenge, particularly for communities like ours that don't get much funding and support from the state. And that they had anticipated that every four or five years, we would be coming back to the community with a tax cap override budget in order to continue to support the programs. Well, we have managed to go nine years without having to bring an override budget to the community and not only have we been able to maintain our programs, but as we saw in the slide previous, we've made so many improvements in academics, in safety, in security, in mental and physical health. In 2017 and 2023, the city of Rye had to go above the tax cap. There is no way around this in communities. Neighboring school districts, Blindbrook, Mamaroneck, multiple times Mamaroneck, Edgemont. And I know for a fact that there are a number of school districts that are in the same position that we are in this year. 
and they are talking to their communities over the next few weeks about going over the tax cap because of the challenges that the tax cap creates. It is an unsustainable model that is harmful to schools and kids. I understand the purpose. I absolutely understand the purpose of the taxpayer, but it is a real challenge to continue our programs and services and supports for kids. To share with everyone um, just a bird's eye view at the different um, areas in which make up our budget. Um, this is a slide that we present annually, but just to remind everyone of the broad strokes and categories that we look at as we develop the budget. Um, salaries and benefits make up 75% of our budget, and in that area we're looking at a $3 million increase overall. Um, general education, special education, um, actually general education is going up slightly this year, $214,000. Special education, we're showing a net net change of $6,000 below this current year's budget. We have athletics, technology, and curriculum development. These are our um, instructional support areas looking at um, an increase in those areas respectively of approximately $30,000, $197,000, and $27,000. Our transportation related to athletics and special education, we are anticipating an increase of three hundred and seventy-seven, excuse me, $373,000 going into the new school year. Um, District-wide supports, these are um, having to do with our um, human resources, legal, security at the district level, um, our admin building, um, student information systems, all of the behind the scenes supports. We're looking at an overall increase in this area of approximately $4,420. In our facilities department, as we continue to try to maintain our facilities, looking at utility increases, and we'll provide some additional detail, we anticipate a $543,000 increase. Our debt service, um, we anticipate also going up this year, as we had suspected as a result of our borrowing, of $563,000. And our interfund transfers, this is where we transfer funds for capital investment into our capital fund as well as to support, support our special aid fund. We anticipate an, in, an overall increase in this area of $1.7 million for a total budget-to-budget -budget increase of 6.41%. So I'm, I'm going to add some detail and color to these because you have these line item things, but I, I'd like you to just be able to understand what that looks like. So first of all, so the salaries and benefits piece, as the board certainly knows that, and as Gabby just said, 75% of our budget is salaries and benefits. And when you add in the salaries and benefits and the fixed costs that we have and the things that we cannot eliminate from our budget, that's about 85% of our budget that are fixed costs, that are things that we can't get around. Now, on our salaries and benefits, it isn't just direct salaries for our staff. One, as anyone that is in the world of work or has watched what's happening in our society, the health benefit premium increases, our teachers' pay increases, our staff uh, pay for their health benefits, a percentage of it. Those have been increasing each year as part of our contract negotiations when we settled the contracts. We added increases to health benefit costs to our employees. Our salary increases are really in the grand scheme of things. Um, we've made some changes to our contracts, and you may recall not this most recent contract, two contracts ago, some structural changes that have added uh, a level of financial stability to us and a level of predictability, and it really has put us in a good place when you think about what that increase is across the entire five bargaining units. The pension expenses, which we, we have no control over, that is constitutionally protected, and those increases are told to us. We're looking at you know almost $500,000 in 
pension costs increase, our Social Security costs, our Medicare costs, all of those things have increased, which has put the salaries and benefits, and, and, and this is an important number to be thinking about, when we're looking at that 75% section of the budget, which is about a $3 million increase, if we were within the tax cap, our, our entire tax cap amount would be eaten up by this and a little bit more because the tax cap would allow us to grow about $3.2 million. And as you can see by looking at these things, I mean, just inflation alone has caused some dramatic shifts in places like facilities where our supply costs, where our utility expenses, where all of those things have continued to increase. Um, so what we did on this slide is to provide a lot of color in all of those categories on the expense chart. So general education, we now I'm celebrating that we have AEDs with all of our teams, but the AEDs require maintenance, they require replacement parts each year, they require battery upgrades, and those are really important to support. There's an increase, a, a small increase to textbook money. Um, there is a significant increase in the general education fund for school building security guards. Um, our principals could tell you that we run many more before after school events than we ever have before and they require security. So when we have parent conferences, we need to have security. When we have uh, special events, we have security. And so that increase is the increase in security personnel across the district throughout the school year for all of those events. Uh, there's actually a decrease in the special education line of about $6,000. In athletics, there is an increase. Uh, there are increased costs to game officials, the local live, huddle, and family ID, which are all services that we receive from BOCES. There's an increased cost as we've added girls hockey. There's a uh, $15,000 cost for that. And, and what you will see when we move forward with the presentations over the next few weeks, you're going to hear a lot more detail about many of these different um, lines from the different folks. So when Rob Gamigliano comes and presents facilities, he's going to give you a much broader story of the detail within the facilities budget. The same for special education and PPS, the same for athletics and technology. In technology, our infrastructure software licenses are increasing by about $23,000 and our instructional software licenses, so it's the cost for renewal and the additional instructional software is an increased cost of $174,000. Um, we'll be adding a new elementary science program, which you'll hear about from Dr. Murray, um, replacing Science 21. There's been an incredible team that's been piloting multiple programs and there's an increase of $27,000 for professional development to implement um, the new science program. And it's modeled after our effective implementation of math and focus at the elementary schools. Our transportation costs, and these are that we do not have control over. The, the transportation industry is just the costs are ballooning. There's a $373,000 increase. That's for athletics and our special education support. I spoke briefly about facilities in our district-wide support. So there's a lot of things in the district-wide support category. One of those things which is leading to the overall slight decrease in that line is an increase in the contract from Altaris, which is our security consulting firm. And that will actually increase the security coordinator from almost full-time to full-time in the school district. We are running drills 12 months out of the year. We need John on site for that support and expertise. And frankly, I think we have put ourselves in a place from a security standpoint that we are light years ahead of where we were and we are inching very close to being as secure as possibly can be. And that is in large part to the support of Altaris and that, that evaluation that the board supported back in 2018 and the implementation of all of those recommendations since then. As Gabby mentioned, the expected increase to debt service as a result of the borrowing for the capital project 
of $563,000. And then here you have what we think is essential, which is continued capital investment, and this is outside the, the capital bond, of $1.7 million. And what we're looking to accomplish here at the high school and middle school, it is completing the Salto lock system for the entire two buildings. It is HVAC requirements, and that's a $200,000 increase. A $375,000 increase for HVAC work as related to wiring that supports the incredible number of devices that we have both wirelessly and wired within this campus. And as part of our five-year plan, we have to update the wiring in all of our schools. It's been completed at the three elementary schools, and this is the next spot for that to be. And there'll be reconfiguration and construction of new wiring closets to support the servers that support the many devices from our one-to-one -one at the middle school, our BYOD at the high school, and that um, it, those server closets require ventilation and air conditioning um, for the equipment. Um, the PA lockdown system that we've installed at the three elementary schools will also be coming to here at the middle school and the high school for a cost of $400,000. Our existing PA systems are beyond end of life in both of these buildings and frankly are being held together with bubble gum and rubber bands and they need to be improved and they need to be replaced with the safest possible option. Um, as part of the capital bond, as you know, we are going to be um, building the iLab at the high school this summer. When we are in that space doing that uh, renovation, because there are window walls, the wall systems that we have here at the middle school, there is a wall that is to the outside that needs to be replaced. That was not something that was included in the capital bond. We did not know where the iLab was going to be located. Um, and once we've identified that, we know that we have to do that wall and that will be a transfer to capital item as well. And um, as our many athletic facilities support our incredible athletes and students across all levels, uh, the high school gym is slated for a floor replacement. Um, I'm not sure if it's the original floor. I would imagine it was replaced at some point since 1930. But the, the floor can no longer be refinished and needs to be replaced. The bleachers, while the infrastructure is sound, we have been strategically replacing the benches on the bleachers as we, bleachers as we can. But we will be replacing all of the bleachers in the... Um, uh, all of the seats in the bleachers using the existing sound infrastructure. The high school softball field, we've talked about this with the community in the past. The high school softball field is in very rough shape. It is not a great playing surface. It requires drainage. It requires leveling. It requires essentially being dug up and laid back down, getting rid of the craters getting rid of the divots and the things that exist out there now. So that is an essential item. Uh, the high school wrestling room, um, some folks didn't even know we have a high school wrestling room, <laughs> but the high school wrestling room is in dra dramatic need of um, improvement, and that's something that requires ventilation, of which there is no functioning fresh air ventilation in the high school wrestling room. It yes, it involves the pads and the mats being replaced as well. Anyone that's been to a wrestling meet, you definitely want to have fresh air ventilation in that space. Dr. Byrne, if I could just stop you for one second. Um, there has been lots of conversation in the community when we've talked about the capital bond before related to the salt hill locks. So I do see that the Salto locking system is here as part of transfer to capital. So could you help um, myself and other community members understand how this is in the transfer to capital when there's other stuff that's actually when Salto has been in the box? That, that's a great question. So I'm, I'm happy to, and, and Gab, feel free to jump in if I screw this one up. So um, 
When we, and I'm, I'm gonna speak to uh, the capital project in a little bit, but with that particular item, um, the Salto lock system was not something that, that we had included in the capital bond proposal from 2018. In fact, I'm not sure if the technology was where it is today that has allowed us to implement and use it in our schools. But in the capital project, there was replacement of many, many doors. And one of the things that we knew we had to do was because we only at one school, we had a unified lock system in the school and that was over at Milton. We did not have a unified key system anywhere else in the district. So those old images that we all think of in this building, particularly the high school, middle school, of the principal walking around with a giant key ring with hundreds of keys, that's exactly what is in place here. And the Salto lock system was one that was recommended as part of our security audit as we've been working with Altaris, having a locking system that you can instantaneously lock, that you could link to your PA and centralized lockdown system, or that a principal with a swipe of a card or an administrator or security officer with a swipe of a card could put the entire school in lockdown. That's what that enables us to do. And the locks themselves were not part of the capital project, but the doors were. So while we were doing the doors, we identified transfer to capital as a way to bring those lock sets to the schools. And I think it's important to note that we knew when we were formulating what was going to be in the bond that we were not going to be able to touch every location in every building. However, we made a commitment to the fact that we standardized our locking system as well as our HVA controls and made a commitment that any space we did go in as a result of the bond, that those things would be upgraded accordingly, but new that we would be working parallel from a security initiative to improve all of the other areas in our spaces that were not going to be touched by the bond. So I totally understand how people have heard us talk about SALTO synonymous while we were talking about what was happening with our bond, but they really were in two separate lanes as we were working side by side. And I, I will add some more color to this. When, when Gabby talks about what was included in the bond, some of you may recall that the, the bond itself was $79.99 million. We were very clear with the community way back then, and, and I've gone and watched some of the old videos. We had identified at that time $154 million worth of work in the school district. $154 million worth of work across the schools that needed to be accomplished. We knew that 79.99 was gonna get us so far. We made a commitment to the community that we will continue to invest in our facilities through the operating budget, through the transfer to capital, and by establishing a capital reserve fund, which we did, a capital reserve fund that the goal is to fund that to $20 million to help us with future projects, but we made a commitment, I made a commitment, that one, I wasn't gonna be coming back asking for another bond uh, while I was superintendent, but that we were going to dedicate resources, and they're not inexpensive resources, and, and that's one of the reasons why I stand before you tonight talking about uh, a tax cap override budget in order to not have to come back and ask for another significant bond to continue getting that work done. But we will get to that in a little bit. Can I ask one more question on this slide? Sure. Um, clarification question. The 1.2 million in the athletic facility upgrades, I've actually seen the wrestling room and I understand why that's on this list. Um, and the gym and the softball field, they're in desperate need of upgrades. Just curious how you came up with this three, because I know there's a long list of athletic facilities that need to, to be worked on. So we've engaged in a, in a process, and we have a long list of uh, our facilities projects, and we have done some really good work around the athletic facilities and evaluation. And we've looked at condition and community impact. So for the school community and the broader community, what are the, the things that are just in such poor condition that we can't wait any longer 
And, and if you recall, recall with the capital project with the bond, the, the turf field was that big project that was in such poor condition it had to be done at that point in time. Uh, these are in that condition and if we don't do them, they're going to have to come offline and not be usable at a certain point. We're also trying to balance and, and we have prioritized all of our athletics projects. What will have the greatest impact on the most number of students and members of our community? And while these may not yet, we think long term, like redoing that wrestling room so that it becomes a usable space that can be used all day long in addition to wrestling after school and for other sports when it's not wrestling season, we can't do that right now because the only people that want to be in there and really are in there ever are the wrestlers because they're okay with that. Um, although they do need a better facility. But we've looked at how can we capitalize? You know, we have an incredible opportunity with community lunch for kids to be engaging in activities and being together and being in spaces. You can't eat lunch in the wrestling room, but once it's done, it will be a great space for more of the activities that the high school administration and staff has brought to the students during that really critical time in the day. Some historical data to share around our pension um, payments that we're required to make for our teachers as well as our um, folks who participate in ERS, which is just the New York State and local retirement systems. We are looking at contribution rate increases of 15.2% for ERS and um, going from 9.76 to 10.02% for TRS. Um, it's important to note that 85% of our staff participates in our TRS, which translates to um, over almost $5 million in expense in the upcoming year for TRS and over a million dollars in ERS. So this makes up a portion of that $3 million that we were talking about when we're talking about expected increases going into next year related to benefits. And who sets those rates? The state. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And, and just so, so the state uses um, some calculations based on the five-year performance of the stock market. And then, as they've done this year in, in the coming year, they will add increases on top of that For life based on the, the health and, and the size of the pension funds themselves. So from time to time, and I don't, I don't remember, well, it was like a 1% or 2% kicker on top of the right. increase based on performance this year. And they year. look at also life expectancy, right? So they look at their current census and they make adjustments and anticipations as a result of life expectancy of the current population. Another huge driver in our benefits area is um, health insurance for um, our faculty and staff. We anticipate an 11% increase for the 24-25 school year. Um, so this is an expense that currently sits at 12.5 million, anticipating that to increase to 13.8 million. And, and while this was a, a very disappointing number to us, the other main plan that school districts use in New York State, it's gone far higher. This year, I believe it's a 17.5% increase. And last year, while we were at 8%, NYSHIP was a over 25% increase on premiums. So we're, it's a very good plan. Um, and it's one that um, Swiss chip that is very cognizant of the impact of the rate changes on school districts and has been exploring ways to reduce costs to our school districts by looking at the benefit plans themselves and talking with providers about ways to decrease those costs associated with it. And just, um, just to confirm, because I feel like if, as we've talked about this over the years, that's a consortium that we are part of already. So there's, Correct. Um, you know, 
and there's an effort there to try and contain costs yes. Yes, to be a part of that. Yeah, we are not a self-insured. Right. We're part of a consortium, and that enables us to get a better rate. Right. And, and frankly, um, the consortium is essentially closed to other districts at this point because there are districts that um, self-insure, and the districts that self-insure are in a really bad spot right now because it is, it is just killing their budgets. And in some instances, they've had to dramatically reduce the health benefits through the collective bargaining process, but it, it's, it's, it's been a great challenge. And you may recall there was a district further up north a few years ago that was, was bordering on um, fiscal insolvency because of what was happening, and they were a self-insured school district. So, you know, of all the consortium that are out there that are available to us as school districts, we're fortunately in the one that is, is really containing and controlling costs right now. And I think you said it before, but I wrote it just for clarification. In our current bargaining unit agreements, we do have provisions uh, or um, sharing agreements or, or with each employee group that we have. There is a cost sharing that the employees pay. Correct. Okay. Yes. So I, I alluded to this a bit earlier, but I just wanted to revisit the capital piece and how we determined and how, where we ended up and how we ended up there. So um, 2015 was a, 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 a pretty seminal study that was done in the school district. So each five years, every five years, New York State requires school districts to do what's called a building condition survey. And in 2015, uh, it was not long after the district um, or, or is just before the district had decided to no longer outsource the facilities department. Um, they did a full analysis, a full, um, very extensive building condition survey because there are several options you can choose. You can do one yourself, and if you have skilled people like Rob Camigliano and Pat Milbauer and our custodians that can go around and complete that analysis. But in 2015, the district did in a, in a very um, smart way brought in outside consultants to do a deep dive into our facilities and determine where our facilities are, what the needs were, and, and file that full extensive report. It included a roof study. It included everything by looking at every boiler, looking at every nook and cranny. That building condition survey was completed and a um, couple things changed over the next couple years. There was some leadership transition in the district. And when I came aboard, one of my immediate charges from the board was to pick up that building condition survey and figure out how we move forward with getting our facilities up to snuff. And so in 2018, we had put price tags on all of the projects that were identified and it totaled $154 million. Between when we identified that $154 million worth of work and 2019, we went through an extensive thoughtful process and came up with a capital bond proposal of $79.9 million, which was unlike any ever presented in the Rye community before. And we spoke to the community and we talked to the community about why this is important. Some of you are sitting up here on this dais because you became highly engaged in the school district because of that capital bond. We identified the highest priority projects based on condition and community impact, which is our mantra when we're looking at facilities. And we included those in the recommended bond scope that was brought to the community and was voted on by the community and approved by the community in June 2019. So when you look at 154 million in 2018 and 79 million in 2019, when you do the math, it's pretty simple. There's a lot of remaining capital projects. And the mechanism for us to complete capital projects is what we refer to all the time as transfer to capital, which is, it's really just the budget line that it is, but it's using operating budget 
to complete capital projects without bonding. And for the future projects that we're going to speak to in a moment, they are prioritized and will be prioritized and completed based on available funding, the condition of the facilities, and the community impact. So this is one you want to blow it up and look at it really carefully. You have three boxes here. On the right, in red, you have the many projects, incredible projects that were included in that capital bond, many of which have already been completed. The secure vestibule entrances at all of the schools, the library media renovations, library media center renovations at all of the schools. The one is happening here at the high school and middle school this spring and summer. The new additions at Midland and Osborne that are in the next phase of the project, they're in the final stages of the design and will be moving forward to replace the trailers and put permanent wings. The third floor renovation here at the high school that took an unusable space and made it into a functioning, usable, up to code space that we could have students in. The elevator that we had to install for accessibility here. The iLab at the high school that's coming this spring and summer. The middle school iLab that many of us have had a chance to be in for student projects and celebrations, community meetings, parent workshops. The auditorium renovations at both Midland and Osborne. The 32 um, Midland, Midland classrooms. I, I don't even want to say that we renovated 30. We got renovated Midland School. We brought fresh air into Midland School. We eliminated the Midland smell. We, uh, we replaced windows in 28 classrooms at Midland. Did the nurse's office. We brought things up to code that hadn't been in code since 1952 and 1956. We updated classrooms at Osborne, which not quite as extensive a gut renovation as was here, but tremendous work that happened across classrooms. We have renovated 26 bathrooms. I'm in the middle of swapping out a vanity and light fixtures in mine, and it's taken me off the rails. <laughs> We've done a tremendous amount of ventilation work. And when we identified that ventilation work, we had no idea that there was something called COVID-19 coming. Mm -hmm. And that ventilation work is so critical to the health and safety of our kids. I, I, the, the, Milt, the Milton replacement of the boiler, the Nugent Stadium field and track replacement, the drainage and the, the field repairs at Midland School, the elevator, I think I mentioned, the electrical services. We, we are now in the 21st century with electric at the high school, middle school, Midland and Osborne. And we were already there at Milton. The air conditioning that's been installed in, in different student spaces across all of the schools. The masonry work, which you recall, we had lots of conversation about that because once we started taking the masonry out, we started to discover that were lots of problems, particularly on this section of the campus that needed to be repaired. The, it's an incredible amount of work that's happened and will be finished in that capital project. But if you look to the left, you've got on top all of the capital projects that we have accomplished with transfer to capital money. So this is operating money that the board has wisely invested through the school budget to continue to make those improvements. And this is just since 2017. The curtain wall replacements, like the one we're going to do at the middle at the high school iLab, we've been replacing curtain walls strategically at the high school middle school campus on the wings that were built. The masonry of the 1930s to 1960s building additions in the high school and the middle school. The, the PA and lockdown system upgrades at Midland, Osborne, and Milton that were not part of the capital project. The gas line here at the high school middle school. The floors here at the high school middle school. The main stage replacement of the pack here at the high school middle school that, had to, that was an unsafe situation and needed to be replaced. I mentioned the basketball hoop systems at the high school. Um, the HVAC controls at all schools. 
that complemented the HVAC work. So the controls were one piece that were not included in the capital project, but we replaced and aligned the controls across all of the schools. So instead of having 17 different control systems in place that Rob could not manage from his laptop to having control systems that can now be controlled for all of the buildings, making us energy efficient. Exterior door replacement at all schools. We, we've replaced the exterior doors at every single school um, in the district, the nurses' offices, the acoustic panels, and again, another great example of partnership with our POs and the PO at the middle school helping to cover some of the costs of the acoustic panels in the gym at the middle school. A ton of asbestos removal throughout the district. You have old buildings, you have an old home, you have asbestos. When we go into a space, we abate asbestos before we do any work there. And asbestos can be in places from chalkboards that are adhering to a wall, to floor tiles, to pipe insulation, all those kinds of things. And the Salto card access at Milton, Midland, and Osborne. And so that leaves us on the bottom left in the white box. And the white box are the remaining capital projects that would need to be funded through our transfer to capital and our operating budget. And the first number of them on the, on the list are projects that uh, we've included in this budget proposal, the window wall at the iLab. So I'm not gonna repeat those again, but there are other projects that still need to be completed that as we continue to move forward and we remain committed to the community about not letting them all pile up and become a massive capital bond again, um, parking lot repavement, roof re replacement. You have to have roof replacements on a cycle. We've done a ton of roof work the last couple of years, but we still have a lot, we have a lot of roof space. And Rob will add a lot more color to uh, the facilities when he comes up in a few weeks. Floor replacement from the old LVT flooring to the, uh, the better quality asbestos-free flooring throughout the school district. The mason, we still have more masonry work. We have, we love our beautiful stone buildings, but our beautiful stone buildings have a lot of maintenance required from repointing, uh, waterproofing, and we've done some, we still got a ways to go. Um, we've got additional window wall replacements that are on our list that will need to be done. Uh, we've got uh, boilers that were not replaced yet uh, that will need to be replaced. Uh, so the list goes on, but this list is a current list of what our facilities needs are. And we've been very strategic about using our transfer to capital to look, I mean, and you look at it, it's a pretty long extensive list up there up top that we've managed to get through just since 2017, in addition to all those incredible projects that were so desperately needed on the right hand side as part of the capital bond. So we, we take the facilities responsibility. Um, it's a very important responsibility and one that we know you get one chance to build a school and then it's the job of everybody behind you to keep maintaining it so that the kids for the next generations have safe and healthy learning environments to be in. Dr. Byrne, if I could just clarify, you mentioned it in passing, but um, the list that's in this, that's in the white box here, it is an ever-growing list, or this is what was 2015 and we've just kind of said, okay, fingers crossed, nothing else happened No, no, in the this, last we add years. things to the list when, when we know that it has to get done. So okay. basically the, the left-hand side is what couldn't be included, so it's the black and the white, what couldn't be included in the capital bond, it's, it's in here somewhere, plus anything new that's come up. Like window walls in 2015 may have been fine, but we're not in 2015 anymore. I had dark hair in 2015. <laughs> um, I don't anymore. Thank you. So this is the revenue summary slide that we are used to seeing, just identifying the breakdown of how our budgets are supported. Um, obviously, property tax being our number one revenue source. 
um, included also are other taxes that we receive from sales tax from the county, utility tax from our utility providers, charges for services. We always try to get the biggest bang for our buck when it comes to interest and earnings. Um, one thing I do need to note here is the one negative on the page is the anticipated decrease in state aid. Unfortunately, this is a story that we tell a lot. Um, and we I'll get to that just to show you the historical on that, as well as the continuation of the anticipated use of fund balance that will remain the same at 2.7 million. I, I do think that's an important piece to, to keep in mind because people do often ask about fund balance and there's, uh, and, and Gabby will certainly speak to that shortly, but there, there's a lot of restriction to what we can do, but we believe as an administrative team that we do have to look at our fund balance every year and make responsible decisions about what's best for the financial health of the school district and our credit ratings, but also what is most respectful of the community in trying to use that fund balance to offset increases in other places. So we, we are very comfortable uh, with that 2.7 million. Um, we, as you notice, if you look back over the last number of years, we have increased that, and we recognize that that's a, it's a tough game that you play with fund balance, and you really have to be careful and mindful of that, and we believe that this is a solid number that protects the financial stability of the school district and is also very respectful of the community and the taxpayers to help offset the increases. Again, just to follow up on yes. the state aid projection, as you can see, um, we continue to see a decline in this area, um, which makes it difficult as, you know, we continue to try to support all of our programs. So this is clearly not a revenue source that we can rely on in any significant way. And I do know that uh, any board officers, you know, Jen and Jane have, have been through this. I know when Chris was vice president, he dealt with this. The, the level of advocacy with our legislators to, to try and stop this incredible frustration of, of diminishing support from the state of New York. We are at it all the time. We, I mean, I think some of our elected officials run the other way when they see us coming because they know what we're going to say. We have meetings scheduled um, th uh, Thursday. We have meetings with Shelley Mayer. Um, we have a meeting with the local Sound Shore districts. We have an individual meeting just with us and Senator, State Senator Shelley Mayer, who's the head of the Education Committee. We have a meeting coming up with Assemblyman Steve Otis. We have participated in lobbying efforts with my Superintendents Association, Gabby's Assistant uh, Superintendents Associations, and we will continue to barrage the state with those advocacy efforts. But it's not a good story to tell if you look at where we were in 2018 and where we are today. And, and this year's cut of 384 or so thousand dollars is just incredibly frustrating. So for, I mean, as you said, the gap between 2018 and now, almost 25% decrease. Do you know what overall state aid roughly across the whole state is in that time period? I believe that the governor is explaining that she has increased state aid um, and that she said things like every district's receiving a 3% increase in state aid, except for some. We're one of the some. Um, it just in this area, I would say 50% of Westchester districts are seeing decreases like us, and we're not by far the worst. Um, Bedford, it's devastating. Mount Vernon, it's devastating. Chappaqua, Harrison, I mean, the numbers are staggering just locally the number of districts where it's going down. So I, I, I don't know how they came up with that 3%. There are some areas, and I, I don't want to get sidetracked and go a little bonkers on the state, but they, they will say that they've allocated money for certain things that they know we cannot use, like universal pre-K funding. We don't qualify for universal pre-K funding, but they put a number in our budget allocation that we can never take and we can never use. One, we don't qualify to use it for community programs 
and we don't have the space to use it. We don't have the space to build programs. So, you know, you'll see on our state aid allocations over a million dollars for universal pre-K, and they'll say that's an increase over last year. But they're going to take it away because we can't use it later on in the budget process, and it will show we've now been shorted another million dollars by them. But that's exactly one of the points I wanted to make sure you make because while we look at these state aid numbers, they're decreasing, but they're also falsely inflated. There's yeah. money that is being allocated that is not accessible. And we have gone to the legislative branch. We have said to them, allow us to use this money for other programs. While we may not need pre-K, we have students who need fundamental uh, early literacy or emerging literacy needs. We were denied that request. We will make that request again. On I'm Wednesday, pretty on sure Thursday. we're going to be denied. But it is extremely frustrating when you look at a number that you know is less and, in fact, will be even mm -hmm. less. By the end of and I think, Dr. Byrne, um, it might be helpful also for you to provide a little bit of understanding about how the governor said she expects districts to make up for any losses in state aid, which is in complete contradiction to how we must budget. Right. So, one, they we're we've been categorized as a wealthy school district, even though the tax cap exists in every school district. And so you have that limitation that exists. But the governor, what I've been told from our local legislators is that the governor's comment has been that school districts need to spend down all their reserves. But the whole point of the reserves is protective. And you can't spend down all of your reserves because there's only a small percentage of your total reserves that are unrestricted that you can use for different things. So, you know, it, it just, it, it, it flies in the face of uh, good fiscal management to spend down reserves. So, uh, you know, I'm gonna try and stay hopeful. I, I, I do appreciate that our local officials are willing to sit down with us and hear from us, but you know, we hear a lot of the same lines every year is that the money's the money and it's just a matter of where it's gonna go. And frankly, it's not the most popular thing for elected officials to allocate more money to school districts like ours. There's a lot of need in the state. Um, there's a lot of need here in Rye as well. And um, that's something that I wish would be considered because there, there are things that prohibit us from accessing that other people, we go for grants, I mean, we're, we're doing things from a mental health standpoint that are really cutting edge and could be great models for other places. And we applied for a grant earlier this year and we were denied. And we were denied because of the wealth of our community. Even though we can't just raise them, you know, it, it's just a flawed system that we have to live within, which puts us back in this position of where the board was in 2015, which is in order for us to maintain our programs in the quality that they are, we have to, every now and then, as a course of regular business, do a tax cap override. We, ha we have to be able to do that. And, and we've been fortunate that when it's happened here before, it was an incredibly supportive decision by the community. The community came out, the families supported it, the community supported it because it's the right thing to do for schools, for kids, for families, for the community at large for real estate values, it's the right thing to do. And, and it's a thing that we have to use. We have very few tools in our tool belt that we can use to deal with these financial challenges. And the tax cap override periodically is one of them that is available to us. And, and it's, it's gonna be a challenge. We have to help the community understand the need, understand the rationale, understand the good fiscal management that we have lived within for many years and will continue to live within and hope that they come out and support on May 21st. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's interesting to go back and you know, when we did this in 2015, if you look at what the historical increases were before that, they were, you know, four, four five, six percent kind of steady. Um, and those weren't fiscally irresponsible times. You know, Rye has always been a very, very tightly run school district. Um, we said at the time that if you're going to force a 2% tax cap, you're going to get this pattern where you where just because costs don't care about caps um, that are artificial. 
So if you, if you run a, the, if you expect things to run in that same tight fiscal discipline, where you expect a four or five, six percent-ish kind of you know, range over time, that this is exactly what you'd see. You'd see a need to come back every few years. Um, you know, I, I commend the district and all your hard work on, on making it nine years without, a, without an increase. It's, um, it's, it's a longer time than we expected when we did this back in 2015, but it's, you've described exactly the situation that hasn't changed. Just to give a look at um, the district's reserves, a historical review of them, um, as was previously stated, we have reserves. However, a number of our reserves our, are earmarked specific for specific uses, including tax cert reserve, um, retirement reserves, which are very new to our system that for many years the state did not allow districts to even run reserves for retirement. Um, uh, the Gab, if I could just interrupt, and the reason um, we lobbied to get those retirement system reserves is because not too long ago, we were seeing increases annually in the 20%, 20 percent, 20 plus percent, and, and you just can't navigate that. So while we can look at those reserves and say, well, why don't we just tap into those this year? This is a good year in terms of the ERS and TRS increases. And it could be a scary time where we're back at 22% increases, which is exactly why we have those reserves to help navigate those days when they come again. The 2019 capital reserve, that was something that was put forward at the time of the um, bond vote um, to offset future capital expenditures or investments. As and, and that was one that we put through a $20 million Correct. amount so that over the years we could fund that so that when we have larger projects, we just go to the community and do a referendum to take money from the capital reserve and it is not at any cost to the taxpayers, it's the tax neutral and it just shifts in. We're not clearly at the $20 million mark yet to, to be able to start accessing that and using that in a judicious manner appropriated, which is the dollar amount that we speak about um, to support the upcoming year's budget. Encumbrances, these are essentially promissory notes from the prior year, meaning purchase orders for commitments that have already been made, but that have yet to be received or fully expended. So those are funds that are earmarked as already um, identified as being utilized. And then your undesignated, which the um, undesignated gives you the opportunity to use funds for um, emergencies. I'll give it a perfect example. Hurricane Ida would have been um, something had we not had appropriate insurance in place for flooding as well as in the middle being in the middle of a capital project that we were able to utilize our builder's risk insurance because if everyone remembers um, much of what we had just completed as part of the bond actually got destroyed as a result of Hurricane Ida. Um, but had we not had those insurance opportunities, we would have had to use the undesignated um, as a result of an emergency. And I would say just like a homeowner who has flood insurance for, for those of us who live near the water, there's a maximum amount. So our flood insurance policy has a maximum amount. We would have, if not under construction, we would have exceeded, so our maximum amount, we don't have a choice. The most we can get is a million dollars. So it hasn't gone up. We've been lobbying to increase that. $2.8 million, uh, the majority of the 1.8 was covered by our builder's insurance. If we weren't under construction at that time, we would have been going into that undesignated uh, reserve to pull that 1.8 out to cover those costs. And unfortunately, we know the flooding is not something that we can ignore. It's a fact of life. Or predict, or stop. Mm -hmm. I or try impact. to predict it, but you know. We have faith in your predictions. Um, <laughs> the, the drop in the tax cert for the last couple of years, what's, what's driven that? So some is utilization as a result of settlements that come our way. And some is 
reallocating toward the needs based on what we anticipate the future use would be. So trying to look at our ERS and TRS forecasts of where we may need funding going forward um, or making sure that un our undesignated fund because of the circumstances that we're talking about with million dollar caps on flood insurance, making sure that we have the ability when needed to forgive the pun, but have the money for the rainy day when it, when it comes upon us. So obviously that's list is restricted, but in terms of, you know, some money's flowing out of that always for settlements. So what you're saying is that we sort of not funded it back as much so that we could put some of the money in other areas where we Correct. are a Historically, more about. so how the tax reserve um, operates is every year we receive or, and review um, new settlements, right? Though that list is put together, the auditor reviews it at the end of the year, identifies what our exposure and liability is. We then try to fund it as much as we possibly can with the expectation of it's a six year rolling look back at settlements because typically you will have a settlement outstanding for multiple, it will be for multiple years and it will sit in settlement or non-settlement um, for a number of years. Unfortunately, when you look at our exposure in terms of our tax certs, um, we are well underfunded compared to what the exposure is. We try to fund as much as we possibly can, but also understanding that there are other needs in other reserves that we want to address as well. Just to remind everyone, um, we talked about it quite a bit, but just the property tax cap, it is an eight step calculation that lives within the law. Um, every school district, every municipality goes through this eight step calculation. There are two major factors that are set by the state that we have no control over, which is the growth factor, which is applied to your, um, it's based on your local community that's applied to your current tax levy, um, and it's a multiplier. In addition, you take the differential of what the state identifies as ex, um, exceptions to the calculation, which would be your debt service payments, any pension payments in a given year that exceed a contribution rate beyond 2%, um, and your expenditure as it relates to transfer to capital. So not what you budget, but what you actually expend in that year. And you take the difference from the current year to the anticipated year, and that's how you apply your um, exemptions. In addition, it looks at the rate of inflation. However, it caps it at 2%, hence the 2% tax cap that they talk about. You apply that calculation. If you look at it for Rye for the upcoming 24-25 school year, um, and you do the math, the tax um, levy that we are proposing, which is 99.048 million, which is a 6.91% increase compared to the tax cap calculation of 3.47%. As a result, um, when we ask everyone to come out and vote, we will be looking for um, a supermajority, which would require 60% approval rating. As opposed to a simple majority, which is what is typical in a budget vote. And that is required by the law. tax cap legislation. Correct. Yes. So it's not something that, that we ourselves set up or no, something. It is the, the self-imposed 60%. Yep. Correct. To go 3.1 million over the cap. Yeah. So any, typical, any, even it, if it you win be, a penny yeah, yeah. over, you it still be, need 60%. Yeah. It's yes. not a typical 50 No, plus. it was part of the legislation that was put in place when the tax cap was put in place. Just to give everyone a sense, um, uh, the historical tax levy increases that we've experienced. I'm yeah. sorry, Gabby, no, just okay. for a moment. Sure. Um, Dr. Byrne, should a 60% not be achieved, what then are the implications? So, so the board would be faced with making a decision uh, about whether to go to a second vote um, or to just adopt the budget. So you can um, go to a second vote 
with whatever you could put the same one out, you could modify it a little bit, but you could bring a second vote to the community. If that vote fails, then it's a 0% increase, which would mean for us, we'd have to cut, what's that number? It's, it's a massive amount of yeah. $3.2 million. We, it would be a zero increase from where we are today. Okay. So we would have to cut massive amounts of things to get to that zero. And so that's th that, that would be a 3.2 reduction from the current 23-24 budget for us to operate in a 24-25 school Correct. year. Correct. You would reserve, you would resort back to a tax, uh, tax levy of 92.6 million. So I, I just wanted to add one um, one note to this because I, I think Chris, you you talked about increased costs over the years. If we just look at the last three years, um, inflation in twenty one, the year twelve month inflation was just under five percent. In twenty two, it was eight percent, and twenty three is over four percent. And we've managed um, through very responsible fiscal decisions to stay within the tax cap while navigating these extraordinary inflationary environments uh, and still keeping our tax increases within the cap. And it, you can only do that so long uh, before you, you have to make a shift. So this takes a look at the historical tax levy increases. Um, we thought it was important to identify the year in which we did um, our last override, which would have been the 15-16 school year, and um, how we've maintained the tax levy since then. And so um, our final informational slide uh, with regard is that, so it's a tax levy increase of 6.91%, and that's a levy of 99.048587, uh, and that's the amount that has to be raised by local property taxes to support the recommended budget. Um, and the estimated taxable assessments, and this comes directly from the, the assessor from the city of Rye. We got this number this afternoon from the assessor, and that's for uh, the estimated taxable assessments for Rye, 132916387 Now that, that number, and we always put an asterisk here, won't be final until July 1st um, because that changes and we get updates throughout the budget process from the assessor at the city. And so that converts to an estimated tax rate per thousand of assessment of 745.1947. And again, as in the estimated tax assessments, that will potentially move a bit depending on what happens with the assessments between now and July 1 when the board issues the tax warrant. So as always, uh, budget comments to the board at rcsdboard at riseschools.org, to me at burn.eric at riseschools.org, my number is also there, to Gabby at peruccio.gabriella at riseschools.org, or if you forget all of that, just remember feedback at riseschools.org, we get all of those. Um, you can call us, you can email us, we'll talk with you, um, come to more meetings, listen to the information we have to share, which is our next slide, so next Tuesday, February 13th, we have Dr. Friedenberg and Dr. Murray presenting curriculum and special education in PPS. On March 5th, we have Dr. Sassone, Ms. Reed Dulay, and Mr. Gamigliano presenting technology, athletics, and facilities. Uh, next week, by the way, is also open topic. So after those two presentations, the board will, if you've never been, it's a great fun and a really good way to interact and speak with the board. Board will step off from the table and we'll have a setup out here in the audience for community members to uh,
talk a bit with the board, give some feedback uh, potentially on the budget or whatever other things you wish to talk about. March 19th. So what we have today, I presented the budget that I'm recommending to the board. Between now and March 19th, the board will have lots of opportunities to pick this apart, think about it. And then on March 19th, you'll be charged with adopting a budget that would then go before the community. Once that budget is adopted, there's an official um, budget hearing when members of the public can come and speak about that adopted budget. And then on May 21st will be the budget vote and the trustee election. So uh, in the process, we will make sure that, because we know that uh, during COVID, lots of new folks moved to the community to help people ensure that they are registered to vote and they understand that really important responsibility. But we'll have the vote um, right here next door in the middle school gym on May 21st from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Thank you. And it's quite a comprehensive presentation. I, um, I know the board appreciates it, and I certainly um, would just suggest to the community that really the presentations to follow on the 13th and on March uh, 5th are really wonderful opportunities to get a real in-depth understanding of what's exactly behind those numbers, but also uh, if you go back to the slide that Dr. Byrne had related to all of the programmatic um, improvements and changes that have been made since 2017 it's also a great opportunity to understand how and where those sit in the budget so I would certainly encourage the community do any other board do we have questions or comments from the board at this time it was an unbelievable presentation there's so many moving parts to this and the layout and the amount of information in this presentation book is so helpful so thank you to everybody for all the clear work that went into this and you know there's so many things outside of our control and that's hard to accept for people who like to control things um, but <laughs> um, it was so well laid out to understand those pieces which is a big part of this override um, I'd love just to hear you talk about the more discretionary or sort of less you know state controlled parts of the budget and how you guys build those out I know we're going to hear about them as Jean mentioned more granularly by each of the department heads but you know as we think about this budget increase getting a sense of that sort of how you look at the costs and maybe any potential containment measures or even as you were building out this budget how you think about what we're asking a lot from our community and how we can where we're controlling costs or how we think about that balance on the discretionary side we'll certainly do that as we move forward in the process absolutely well and i think just to pick up on what kelsey was just saying i mean i think each year when we talk about the budget the sense is always to um, be as conservative and cost containing as possible. Um, and so, you know, I, what comes across to me in, in this level of depth and detail that you just presented, all of you just presented to us, is the, um, is the care with which you approach this. Um, this is never, it, it, it's, it's never um, something that you want to have to do to, to come to a community and say this is what's needed, but it is what's needed and it may not be the pleasant or easy thing to do, but it is, it's a necessity. Um, and especially when we think about, I think, um, and then looking back at the investment that we've already made programmatically and from an infrastructure standpoint, um, that these are all continuing to support all of that investment as well. So, uh, you know, I, I definitely look forward to hearing from all of the administrators because um, they always do such a great job giving that level of detail. Um, but I think, you know, this is, it, it's, a, it's, it's a tough situation, but again, you know, I think we, I feel as though every year when you present the budget to us, it is always with, with 
with a uh, eye toward how can we how can we serve the community best how can we serve the students best and you know we're in a moment where that's it's a, it's a tough situation yeah and it, and we really focus um, and I think this speaks to, to both Kelsey's comments and yours Jen that we start with need right. you know I've, I've learned in my my time here in Rye in, in getting to know the community and and being out there and I, I spent a fair amount of time with our civic organizations with our seniors knowing that for them it's really important for us to be focused on need and what we have to do and what we have to do to keep our school district strong mm -hmm. our community wants a strong school district and and that is a perpetual challenge that we face every year so that that notion of prioritizing mm -hmm. and what is in the condition that needs the most attention and what has the most impact uh, across our school and larger ride community? Well, and I, you know, we've had, as all communities have had uh, as a result of COVID, we've had an influx of families who have come and who have chosen ride. And the reason they have chosen right is because of the schools, because of the community that you can be a part of within the schools. Um, I was actually in town last weekend and walking as I do quickly with my head down. And I <laughs> was behind a, a couple who probably don't have kids in the school because of which I just, they were of a uh, generation that would probably not biologically have children in our school <laughs> district currently. Uh, but what I found so fascinating was there was a, there was a I promise, there's a point. There's a point. No, no, well beyond you, Chris. Don't worry. There was a poster in one of the windows about the Mamma Mia performance. And the husband, they were walking their little dog, and the husband yanked on the wife, and he said, stop, stop. We need to, he said, take a picture of this. He said, I want to go see this. And I thought, now how cool is that? <laughs> they clearly are, have aged out of our system. But for them, our school community is still their community. And the idea that you live here and you want to participate and you want to come see our kids perform is amazing. And it is a testament to what has been built since 2017. Because I remember clear as day when you showed up, and I look at this list and I think, man, that's a lot of stuff. And then you look at the financial implications and, and the fact that there hasn't been an override in that time to build up through baby steps, lots and lots of programmatic instructional changes. And it is an impressive list. And it's an unfortunate situation that we find ourselves in where to even start the day for 24, 25, you're coming out behind fiscally in a tax cap environment. And so I know that um, myself as a board member, and I can fairly confidently, they'll throw things at me if I shouldn't speak for the rest of the board when I say, <laughs> we will be listening and looking for opportunities and, and, and making sure that everything that has been committed to in previous years continues to be committed to in a fiscally responsible way to ensure continued success for our students. Because as I've said before, every one of us has children who are sitting in the classrooms in this school district who are going to be the beneficiaries of the hard work that continues to be done. And we want to ensure that that continues to happen for everyone in this community. So I certainly look forward to all the great presentations ahead and all the conversations and communications that we have between and amongst each other and in the community about this budget going forward. So thank you. And just one comment, I, I you know, the, we have our annual road show that Yes, we, we do. We have a lot of, of visits lined up already so that we can reach all members of the community uh, from the preschool families to the seniors. Uh, and we'll, we've already sort of had a soft launch of the roadshow. Um, we did a dry run with some realtors uh, a week or two ago. Uh, and we'll continue that. And, and, and we always will, will play new venues if someone else is interested in having us that hasn't had us before we'll be there 
And I am excited that the nursery schools are on our list this yes. year because I know that they took a hiatus from visiting with us or having us visit them. And they are a, key, a huge key component of our um, Community? Stakeholders, stakeholders, our stakeholder group because they are the next group of parents and students and consumers of the district. Mm -hmm. And just to uh, close a loop on the Mamma Mia, the performance is March 1st and March 2nd for those of you who haven't seen the poster in town just so everybody can go. It's going to be a great show. Okay, sorry. I'm back to it. All right. Anybody else? No? All right. Well, thank you so very much for this presentation. Great job. Uh, we will now move on to the hearing of the public on non-agenda items. We welcome and encourage our community members to address the board at this time. Please come to the podium, state your name, address, and if you are representing an organization. To ensure everyone has had the opportunity to speak, please limit your remarks to three minutes. The board is here to listen. The public comment period is not designed to be a discussion. So please understand that we may not respond publicly to your comments or questions at this time. We take your comments seriously and may need more time to process and research an issue. We will ensure questions will be addressed by the appropriate staff member or possibly at a future board meeting. We will not entertain comments regarding individual students or district personnel as these are protected under state and federal privacy laws. Please know we take personnel concerns very seriously. On these matters, we would ask you to follow the appropriate administrative channels. As a reminder, the community may always submit written comments at any time to the board by sending those to rcsdboard at riseschools.org. Seeing no one from the community stepping forward, we will move on to our consent agenda. Can I please have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Chris Rapetto, seconded by Jen Boyle. Let's take a look at the consent agenda. Consent Agenda General. Consent Agenda Fiscal. Professional Appointments. Classified Appointments. Pupil Personnel Services and Special Education. Seeing no questions or comments, uh, vote please to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor? That would be seven nothing. So on this evening's consent agenda, quite a lot of gifts and wonderful, um, as a continuation from Dr. Burns mention in the uh, budget presentation from our partners as our PTOs. So the Midland PTO has generously gifted $8,000 for the fifth grade production of Sandbox Theater. $15,000 for field trips and enrichment programs, taking the children out of the classroom and bringing the classroom to the children, bless you. $20,000 for classroom grants and PTO expenses. The Osborne PTO has also been generous with their gift of $4,000 for field trips, $16,000 for cultural enrichment, which is being uh, programs that are being run through the BOCES Cooperative. 17,000 to support recess programs, as you all know, big fan of those big muscle movement opportunities for our students, and 20,000 to support the Spring for Rye initiative, which uh, if we all remember is that wonderful, great initiative taken on by two of our parents in the community to help plant uh, and increase our native uh, tree population here in our schools which is great. Uh, our Midland PTO, not to be left out, also, don't, also gifted $8,000 to go towards their fifth grade production of Sandbox Theater. Uh, in addition, we have a donation from Rye Country Day School in the amount of $3,000, which goes to support the Herd in Rye uh, parent speaker group. The Rye City Schools is not responsible for Herd and Rye, we are merely kind of the financial holding group, as it were. All of the efforts and um, payments for speakers that come through Herd and Rye are donations from various parent organizations, both inside the Rye City Schools as well as our surrounding communities. It's a great um, group that runs, so very happy to have them here. 
Uh, let's move on now to presentation and discussion number two. Policy, 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 Mrs. Boyle. Thank you. Uh, so these are the three po policies that we uh, talked about last meeting. Um, the three are uh, non-discrimination and equal opportunity, which is policy 0100. Uh, Timeout and physical restraint, uh, which has been updated to include all students, which is policy number 4321.12, and uh, homebound instruction, which is policy number 4327. Um, there were no additional questions that I received from anyone related to these updates. So if there's any additional now that people want to discuss. Seeing none, we can move these forward to be adopted uh, with these changes at our next meeting. Great. Oh, sure. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, okay, we will move on to communications to and from the board. Uh, board and district committee updates. Curriculum Council, January 31st. Anybody want to give a great presentation? Mrs. Erickson has got a big smile on her face. Callie? <laughs> um, yes, yeah, Sean and I were at the curriculum council meeting um, last week on the 31st we had two we heard two presentations the first one was about ASL and um, by Jen Turoff and um, it is for curriculum for year seven so right now we have ASL through year six so she presented for year seven and um, it's interesting to note that we're so lucky in Rye that um, she mentioned that not many school districts offer ASL and especially through year seven so that's the, you know, so that can, children can continue all the way through high school. So that was a really exciting and interesting presentation. And then we heard from Caitlin Sasson and Amy Leahy about engineering. And um, it's redesigning the curriculum because right now there's a class intro to engineering is the first course in the high school. But what's become apparent is that the kids, now that they have engineering in middle school, they're too advanced for that class. And so the proposal is to um, make it into two semester classes the first or one of them is robotics and then the other one is modeling for engineers so it's replacing and redesigning this class to make it you know more effective and more interesting for the students so those are the two presentations that we heard well that's now at least the second time where i've heard that our students are too advanced that we have to create more advanced classes so that's <laughs> first it was spanish now it's, I mean, it's great. It's amazing the things that are able to constantly be redone. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, so we will have another policy meeting in a few weeks. So we look forward to that. But, uh, and there will also be a technology meeting. So that's very nice. Mm -hmm. And our technology reps know who they are. Oh, that's you, Mrs. Yes. Boyle? Excellent. It's you're going to double duty next time. You're going to have lots to chat about in, in March. March. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll be waiting with bated breath to hear all about it. All right. Any other communications to and from the board? Nope. Okay. Uh, so that means I will just remind you all of what you already know, which is our next meeting is going to take place next week on February 13th. Hold on. Oh yeah, where we will have our curriculum and PPS presentations, as well as open topics. So we hope to see you all here. And until then, can I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Sean Clapper, seconded by Chris Rapetto. All those in favor? Seven nothing, thank you, have a good evening. <laughs>